Well, then, please uh, welcome uh, Florian Sobiecki. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, I am very grateful to be able to speak here today. It's actually exactly a, um, six months that I have started working at the company that I am going to present work from, um, my work, and I started it in this building. Um, the first few uh, months, my company decided to have me um, use the co-working space, and let me tell you, it's a great um, place to work. Um, unfortunately, the company decided it's no longer <laughs> necessary to have me be somewhere um, different than from the main building of the company. but. Um, I will uh, talk to you about <clears throat> um, machine learning and, um, so to speak, um, some, um, well, issues of Internet of Things in the sense of um, an industrial um, way of including the Internet. So I would like you to um, um, consider, well, <laughs> why don't I just show it, um, a what, what really looks like a bar with beer taps that's supposed to be um, um, a production line which is um, linear in the sense that items come in and are being <coughs> um, worked at and then passed on to the next to the next uh, production stage and um, so um, in this so to speak automation framework um, of course um, the Internet of Things also um, is being developed and used and there's something called uh, Industry 4.0 as you probably know and um, the um, standards that are being developed and followed by a lot of companies um, uh, include one in which for so to speak different parts of um, detail or different stages along this production line um, <clears throat> different norms are being used. So, for example, um, there is a norm that considers, so to speak, the whole line, um, the whole, so to speak, set of processes that, that are necessary to make the product from the stage of uh, initial uh, resources to the finished product. And all the, so to speak, um, systems that are being developed to to monitor this and to control this are called manufacturing execution systems. And that is on a, on a fairly high level that you try to overlook something. So, for example, a company as mine is called Run IT, and I should at least show their sign over here, <laughs> um, tries to um, give um, the, um, the manufacturer a so-called decision support systems at his hand and then um, has has to kind of um, learn at which level exactly the the customer likes to have the system designed for so one level below the the MES or the manufacturing execution system level would be the one where you only consider single processes maybe maybe a process in which a single step is carried out and of course it still um, involves a bunch of you know more elementary processes that you might um, carry out with these programmable logic controllers so there are this is just at a intermediate stage of a of a pyramid of, of a hierarchy in which um, you can um, use the norm that is being developed and then develop some software for it so the, the reason why I'm putting this out is because um, what I'm going to show you is some some way of um, trying to artificially find um, malfunction in a, a production line to somehow detect if if something is going wrong along the along the um, process of um, making this or working on the workpiece and. <clears throat> What is, so to speak, necessary is that um, that um, some sort of statistics is carried out in the, in the sense of gathering of data in the beginning and using the data for um, then making decisions about products that come out at the end. 
So um, I'm, I would like to give you, with this talk, an idea of what this hierarchy means for systems like this. Um, so <clears throat> consider what we have already kind of talked about, uh, stages at which the work pieces rest until they are moved towards the next manufacturing step at which some sort of robot is working on them and um, alters their state. Um, consider when this happens, some device, some sensor that collects data of how the step is carried out. Maybe by looking at the physical properties of the work pieces using sensors, or maybe by using some sort of state data of the machines themselves. It's in fact more common that along production lines, these, these robots nowadays have some sort of outlet that you can use and collect your data uh, with, because um, this is just becoming more and more a standard, then um, the situation in which work pieces themselves are measured with some sensors, which is usually um, more expensive to, to do. So if it, at the end of the line you have some sort of quality test in which you decide whether you actually take this um, piece and, and, and send it out for, for sale, then um, <clears throat> you, you would like to understand in what way the steps that have led to this product have influenced it being okay. And you would like to do that by making, um, well, by gathering all these um, data and then in some way understand when, when this is going wrong, when this moves out of the space of being okay. So it's a classical machine learning task, especially when you um, realize that lots of these um, things can be nonlinear. So suppose um, that you have some, some machine that works under pressure and because there is a security pressure valve somewhere that in certain situations this valve opens up, maybe if the pressure is very high. So until that high pressure level is reached, everything is the same. And therefore typical are characteristics of such changes that are not small when the corresponding influencing um, variable is also small. So there's this sort of discontinuity that is typical and therefore also um, makes it harder and makes it sometimes impossible to use standard statistical methods such as linear regression. Um, what you see here is this um, square. It's a typical, so the reason why I'm showing you this is because we, we have some sort of a, a lead, a lead um, um, customer and at, at the time uh, he wasn't giving us any data, so he was just showing us things. So um, what you see here are things that I simulated from what I've seen. <laughs> so it's, but it's very typical of um, what you get is, what this is is are certain items that are produced on a, on a batch level. So you count um, after each processing of such a batch, how many of the items actually per, uh, pass the quality test and how many don't and the red ones don't, so that, that was really the way it was in this case. And typical failure rates were between 2 and 10 percent. And what, what we um, were told is that this kind of step, step um, <laughs> so non-continuous non behavior happened there. And so we thought we should try to compare standard prediction modeling techniques with um, ones that are able to, to cope with these non-linearities. What, what then happened was we, um, so to speak, um, decided whether we should actually give the um, customer a, a tool at hand that he can use just like you would do if you were actually um, forecasting stock um, exchange rates or something like that. But we decided not to do that. We, we decided um, in, in cases like this, it would be too, um, this would be too much of a, uh, of a difficult task. And so what we really did was only collected data from a certain time range 
and looked at the range of values that these data assumed. And we, we didn't treat it as a time signal at all. So we just collected data points and then compared this um, set of data with, with, so to speak, the future from then on and did the same thing again and only compared, so to speak, the histograms of the occurring values in these higher dimensional spaces. So it is principally something very stupid that we did. We just looked at how, um, how frequently something occurs and completely disregarded in which way the order was that these events occurred. And it, it turned out, and that's, that's a typical situation in big data, is that when you have a lot of data, it is actually quite reasonable a lot of times to make some sort of assumption of stationarity in the sense that what happens, happens in a sort of equilibrium. I mean, usually the data that comes flying at you is so much and it's at such a high rate that even if things change, it's reasonable to then make an assumption, okay, we restrict ourselves on a small time interval in which these changes, as they do occur, are just happening slowly. So in this case, we took the first 500 points that's in the middle of the picture, um, called that our historical data set, and try to then <clears throat> predict what's going to happen. And um, we, we continuously increased, um, so to speak, how long into the future we would look from um, this time when the signal went further up. And what we got was um, from these first few values, predictions of whether actually the new data was substantially different in the sense that the underlying distribution was a different one. So we could actually make two sample statistical hypothesis tests for a hypothesis like, is the underlying mean the same from this old data set and the one that's coming flying at us? And it's interesting that if you use methods that like classical ones, like the green line over here, um, it's just linear regression. It just takes much longer to pick up on, on effects. It takes much longer to be, it has much more um, momentum, so to speak, until it realizes that something changes. In this case, it, what you see is the lower bound of a confidence interval where when zero is part of it, that means you can't exclude the possibility at a high level of significance that the two rates are different, that the two means of the corresponding underlying distributions are different. So this is how inferential statistics is used in a very simple way, just by collecting points, forgetting their time structure, and just collecting the histograms, basically, and coring the, corresponding them in terms of two distributions which, for which one can make the test. Are they the same or are they different? So th this is our approach, and um, I would like to show you, however, what, so um, instead of showing for the details of this graph, I, I might just refer to the brochures which are lying around over here. You can study that in detail, but I have an app for you um, where I would like to show you the, what nonlinear things can actually do when they occur. So suppose you have some sort of um, data. Up here is the input level, and down here is the output level. So we're assuming that in the beginning of the line, maybe the temperature is varying around this, this mean here, and that, so, you know, as you, as you pick up these pairs of values, and that's the nice thing about um, production lines, what you can do is, as the nth item, as the nth workpiece passes through the first machine, and you make that recording, it will be the first recording, and it will correspond to the first recording of when that item passes through the last machine's um, sensor. So because of the linear structure of the production line, there is a natural uh, situation in which actually supervised learning can be used. And supervised learning means I have X and Y pairs. So I don't have just points that are, uh, you know, floating about in the beginning here, and here we actually know which y value belongs to which x value. 
And this is also what you have, for example, if you think about you know, regression where there's a, a cloud of points and you draw a line through it. And this is what you need to do that. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is when your production environment is this serial one, because of being able to correlate the nth measurements in the beginning with the nth measurements in the, out, in the end, the output, you do have the situation where you can use these supervised learning techniques. So, um, um, if I use linear regression here, and I, um, you see, here's the function, you can't, I know you can't read this, this is unfortunate, but the function which um, maps this kind of data into the one on the bottom is one that has pretty much a step form, so a sigmoidal shape, which is typical for nonlinear transformations. So this means that anything that's above zero is mapped into something above one over here. Anything that's mapped from the negative values is mapped to, to the left side of one, and nothing stays in the middle. So this is what um, happens, I mean, under nonlinear transformations. So let us now train a predictor, in this case just the simplest one that you can think of, just a regression, a linear regression. And what you see is the, the red histogram is the prediction of the <coughs> initial data under the assumption that, that it is a linear model. And as you can see it, it averages and gives you exactly the result in the middle. So it, you can see it's not very suitable at all for, the, for this kind of transformation. Um, so, um, passing to a more sophisticated um, predictor, you see um, they come in different degrees of um, uh, sophistication, and then it, I just hit run, and as you can see, it will take a little longer, but you will see how much better uh, such a different model, and this is the power of these new machine learning uh, algorithms that you know were able, for example, to beat uh, the world's best Go player or to make cars drive. Um, um, what what they are able to do, and um, you can see now there is pretty much uh, coincidence between the predicted and the measured values. Um, you can actually read off in the same way we just talked about the the p-value. P-value being large means there is no um, significant reason to reject the hypothesis that the underlying distribution is the same. So, um, if, however, I, I enter, introduce some perturbation, so to speak, of this data, so, so, so far these have been the same, now on the right you will see what happens when there is a perturbation. So something goes wrong in the beginning of your production line, maybe, maybe a valve has opened up or something, and um, so you see over here, the data is clearly shifted outwards, outward of its specification range or something like that. And then using the, the model that we have just trained, we can check if instead of these nice data, we give the predictor this data. And then we can, if the data, if the prediction tells us um, that this is going to be very different from the output of the historical data set, that maybe one shouldn't continue with the production of this um, workpiece that belongs to this batch, because it, it, with high probability it will f fall out of the... So let me just do the same thing as before, and now run on... Here everything will be the same, but here the input data will be perturbed. And instead of actually producing all these Y values by running running the <coughs> perturbed data through the line, we make a prediction, and as you can see over here, there's a, so the, the blue one is the same as over here, it's the historical data set, and there's a significant difference between the predicted outcome and the measured one. And you can actually see that the p-value has become much smaller. It's not that small yet, but you can read off that probably the mean has significantly changed from the measured to the predicted distribution. And now you, you're in, in the position to be able to inhibit further manufacturing of these pieces that belong to this new perturbed uh, distribution and then save resources. So this is the kind of idea that we're following. 
But um, what I would like to show you is um, the um, what, what else can go wrong, so to speak. Um, you see, what I've just showed you was just a single ooh, um, a single <coughs> assessment of data, and in such a production lines, of course, there can be up to hundreds such measuring points. Suppose you know that inside of your um, <coughs> production something is going wrong, and now you have assessed all these pairs of x, y values data, and collected them, and now would like to decide where is the mistake in your running line. So use it as an analysis tool, a decision support system. Well, a statistician might say, just throw all of this data into one model, make a linear single model, and the coefficient with the strongest significant um, factor will be your answer. And what I would like to show you is that this is actually, there's a problem called mediation in statistics. Um, I'm not, I, I did have another app for that, but I know I can't do this. But I, <laughs> let me show you, when you, maybe you have worked with R before, there's something called the, the empty cars data set. Um, if you have, so what would be your guess? Cars with a transmission type that is um, stick shift, as opposed to manual, I mean, to automatic transmission, which of the two has the be better mileage? You, you think stick shift. Why would you think so? You, you can beat, I mean, almost everybody so far I have heard said automatic because, I mean, you would think that the machine would be able to, for example, if you accelerate, you know, do that stupid sporty acceleration that we always like to do, <laughs> but um, um, kind of smooth it out and then give an optimized. Well, the, the, the thing is that it does, does do that, but the reason why cars that have automatic uh, transmission are actually, on average, using up more fuel is that they are heavier. <laughs> so they're, um, it takes much more weight and that actually leads, on average, to more spending of, of gas. So, um, I'm, I'll, I'll finish in a second. Uh, this is a typical example of a mediator variable, and it's interesting to think about th things like that when you look at, for example, statistical data in which U.S. states people get killed most of, you know, sh sh people shooting. Uh, like, uh, you know, for example, if you com compare Texas with California, it is, y you might, uh, have to look at intermediate values, uh, intermediate effects that come in, and then um, um, what you will end up speaking of are indirect effects that that are in, at the back of this, and this um, can happen in the production line as well. And maybe just one last sentence: um, what this leads you um, to do is that you. Um, go to the, in this pyramid of, of things, to the bottom, the, the most detailed level in the pyramid. So to the, maybe in the, to the, just where a single measurement for a single process is correlated with the output quality failure rate. And then collect that all, and then maybe make a decision support system for that level. And then go one level higher, and then use this information from, from below to, to build on that. So this is kind of what comes out of this as a result that one shouldn't go the other way. Okay, thank you. As I told you, this is uh, the, the most technical uh, talk for, for tonight. Are there any questions from the audience? In the back, I'll... Yes. No problem. Uh, what means training in in yes in your yes? So, um, for example, think of the easiest predictor. That's the one that we looked at in the very beginning, where it's a regression um, line. So, suppose you have all these x y data, and what you would like to do is draw a single line through it that has two parameters, namely the y intercept and the slope, that fits these points most, and even though if they don't lie on a line, what you can do is add up the squared error, so the, 
the difference between the line to the points, and then pick the two coefficients that minimize the sum of these errors. So in this case of this very simple predictor, training would mean determining these two coefficients. Now going to other, for example, to a neural net, it has many, many more parameters of this type, and you just do as many, um, well, training steps. In, in, so you solve a linear system, or you approximate the solution of this um, linear system that makes this is basically an optimization problem as well. And it will give you um, not a regression line, but maybe a regression, func regression function that will, because it's more complex, be able to describe your data much better. Are you using deep learning neural network? Good question. Um, um, actually, deep learning is, so to speak, the best of these um, um, methods. And we have seen that so far, because we are in a one dimension, um, it, it was not necessary to go as far as using neural networks. And in fact, the, the time that, you know, the additional time, the calculation time, makes it actually reasonable not to use that great guns on it. But um, random forests, the, the method I used here, have been um, quite, quite a reasonable choice for this. Also, what you use is when you go higher in this hierarchy of methods, you, lo you lose more and more interpretability. So while for the regression we could use these two coefficients for a slope and an intercept as a geometric quantity, that's not possible anymore for the parameters that are inside a neural net. Um, the good thing about our, our events is we have 10 minutes break, so uh, this 10 minutes break is the perfect time to ask uh, the question to, to, to the expert here. Uh, I saw you, um, uh, you wanted to raise some, some additional question. Um, no, but joke aside, um, so this 10 minutes break is 10 minutes because we, uh, we would like to encourage you to discuss it in smaller groups to find uh, another expert to, uh, to raise any questions, to share uh, name cards, uh, to keep in touch, and yeah, just to follow up the, all the discussions and all the questions you're facing here. So um, I would like to then make the break now. So very thank you again, Florian. Thank you. Thank you.